हेलो so at the outset i would like to thank you all at the outset i thank you all for uh, being present here on a friday evening which happens to be the beginning of the weekend but still um, we had our fingers crossed so many of you have turned up and that's a very uh, hearty thing for us so on behalf of the planetarium and the coexistent consortium um, I extend a warm welcome to you all to this program and uh, we have two experienced speakers uh, Ms. Janani and Ms. Sanjana who would be delivering the talk today. So more than the talk it's going to be a presentation followed by an interactive uh, session with uh, the audience. So the, the success of the program depends a lot on uh, all of us because they'll just get the whole motion started and to keep the inertia and uh, uh, the intellectual discussion. Uh, the onus is on all of us to uh, see to it that it becomes a very fruitful program. Um, so we extend a warm welcome to you all once again and uh, I request uh, Mr. Rahul uh, from the consortium to introduce the speakers to the audience, Mr. Rahul. Thank you, Madam Madison. Hi, uh, again, thank you and uh, welcome again for coming on a Friday evening, like Madhusudan mentioned. So, my name is Rahul Rahul Sundarajan. I am the director for WWF India, uh, Karnataka State Operations. And uh, we're <coughs> I'm, WWF is part of a collective group of uh, 20 plus organizations that have come together to put up this month long exhibition called The uh, Coexistence, the Great Elephant Migration. Uh, a little background about the exhibition per se is uh, India is like an outlier in terms of how people and you know animals share their spaces. We are the most populated country in the world, but we have still managed to kind of hold on to most of our megafauna, uh, including two thirds of our elephants and three fourths of the world's tigers. Uh, while we are in the middle of a mass extinction, uh, you know India has managed to kind of double the number of uh, some of its mega fauna in the last few decades. But it obviously comes with its own challenges. Uh, you know, people have uh, increased, number of people have increased, so as the animals, so it comes with human uh, animal conflicts, which have increased, tolerance levels have kind of gone down. And uh, there is a vacuum in the space of how you manage these shared landscapes. Hence the exhibition in a way. So that's uh, what uh, uh, broadly the objective is so uh, you know there are about 100 plus elephants that are made from lantana these are life size based on actual live elephants in the forest uh, they've been profiled and they've kind of uh, been designed based on them and they are kind of traveling ac across the city to kind of spread the message of coexistence and the need for conservation and uh, the main exhibition is, is in uh, Lalbagh, which is uh, where we have about 60 plus elephants there. And uh, around Lalbagh also we've got a bunch of activities to engage the public, such as floor games, uh, nature bingo, nature trails, and so on. We have about 50 plus talks that are happening uh, across the city. Uh, that's been happening over the last three weeks. Uh, so we started in February 3rd. It's up to March 3rd. Uh, so, um, please do visit the uh, coexistenceconsortium.com uh, website and you'll get all, all the details of what's happening near you. Uh, <clears throat> so, and um, the, one of the main objective of uh, this exhibition is to a, create awareness about the need for conservation uh, and also to kind of connect people with nature rather than disconnect them from it. Uh, more importantly, and I think uh, what today's talk uh, might aptly kind of address that is that conservation is not in part of places like only the forests and things like that. And it is as equally, if not more important, that we conserve urban biodiversity and we increase, uh, you know, uh, how we share the space with, uh, with other species in our city. So <clears throat> today's talk is, uh, sorry.
uh, is an introduction to the ecological landscape, uh, landscape design. We will be sharing some tools uh, and insights on documenting existing biodiversity on a piece of land and designing for its succession. We will also present a few stories from our project where individuals own private farms that exist in gradient zone between reserve forests and urban spaces. Um, and, and how they can con contribute towards conservation and awareness of harmonious existence with wildlife. We will end the session with a short quiz uh, on fauna with some prompts in it which will open up discussion with the audience. Uh, the speakers today, uh, we have uh, Janani Mohan, co-founder of Ananas, a naturalist and an amateur photographer. She enjoys the process of observing and designing niche habitats and planting ecosystems with the hope of harmonious existence, coexistence of humans with wilderness. And we have Sanjana Radhakrishnan, ecological landscape designer and at Ananas, an architect by training. She enjoys working at the intersection of regenerative design, ecology, and restoration. So I will now hand it over to our speakers to take us through this. Thank you. Um, thank you, Rahul. Um, we're very excited for this opportunity to share stories from our projects um, and also all the other talks happening around the city. It's very exciting. Um, uh, also, thank, uh, thank you to JNP for hosting us. What a wonderful venue to do a talk. Am I audible? Am I audible? A little more? Yeah. Is this better? It's on, it's on. Okay. I'll yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so the talk today is about designing for wilderness in human habitats, but secretly we're also just designing for um, humans in wilderness habitats. Um, we are Ananas. We are a small team of uh, nine young uh, designers. Um, we are multidisciplinary. We are almost agnostic to where you come from, but we share the same passion of uh, designing for harmony between uh, in human habitats. Um, we work in the intersection of landscape design, regenerative design, restoration, ecology, and permaculture. Uh, simply put, we design living systems in human habitats. We design farms uh, that are that line between the city and uh, forest reserves, uh, and that's the gradient zones that we will be sharing stories from today. So. Uh we have two beneficiaries, one is the land itself and one is the people. The people that we typically work with are urban folk who have purchased farmland, invested in farmland. And usually these lands lie in the buffer zones between uh, cities and reserve forests or agricultural lands and reserve forests or cities and agricultural lands. Uh, so these are human managed lands, not, uh, not wilderness heavy lands per se and they're often degraded and they're facing threats, anthropogenic threats. Um, we also work with farmers and the locals because ultimately when we're implementing our designs, these are the people who help us put the designs on ground. Um, our objectives uh, in most of these landscapes, although they come from very different contexts, our objective is to uh, create regenerative systems, uh, we always look at habitat restoration, uh, we look at uh, building resilience of the whole ecosystem, uh, we look at wildlife friendly, non-intrusive, in, non inclusive uh, designs, um, we focus on native planting um, uh, when it comes to flora, we also foster connection with the clients and the land because sometimes that curiosity is missing and they don't know really who are the inhabitants of their own land, so we really work on that. We involve local communities because the wisdom and the knowledge that uh, they come from is very useful to us, um, especially with implementation. Um, we highlight ecosystem services uh, because that's something that's not understood very easily. Um, yeah, we are, um, so these are just five tenets of uh, designing for wilderness that we will be sort of repeating through the different uh, projects that we're going to talk about. Like, it's just something to keep in mind. And remember, as we, um, as we go through the presentation, we'll talk about it in the end uh, in detail. So to give you a little bit of context for the designs that we will be presenting, we'll quickly take you through our process because this is the process that we follow for every single design, uh, irrespective of what type of project it is. 
Um, while the nature of work is that we work with people and land, the types of projects we work on differ greatly. So sometimes it could just be a site visit and recommendation. Sometimes it's a very long drawn design and implementation project. So uh, typically we start with uh, a vision which comes from the client or the custodian of the land. Uh, and then we move into our environmental study, which is an in-depth understanding of the land itself. From there, we uh, delve in, into uh, a process called elements, linkages, and zoning. Uh, we'll explain this in a little more detail, from which our master plan emerges. Um, since this is a design process, we have a very real master plan at the end of it, uh, consisting of elements that actually go on ground. In that way, we are like architects or landscape designers. Uh, and from there, we move into implementation or execution on ground itself. Um, so we realize that we are not the the stakeholders of the land. We are very much buffered from it. Uh, we will we will be involved in the project for maybe a year, sometimes lesser than that, maybe two years at the max. So it's really the vision of the client and uh, meeting that halfway uh, with what the land can offer that uh, that we really have to bring out in this process of uh, visioning, and uh, and we we really. The, the vision and this whole process of design is really important for us and that's what brings us together at, that we believe in, no matter what our background is, uh, is the solid uh, process that we've come up, uh, uh, come up with over the years. So vision, we make sure it's a whole session with the client sometimes, even if the client is clear about what they want or sometimes they're not. Um, we ask very basic questions, we go upstream with the client as we call it. Um, talk about what they really need, what do they like about the land, what are their like long-term aspirations, what are their childhood aspirations. Um, this is where even expectation setting is really important sometimes to say that, you know, you might you might want a Bali-esque landscape, but you're in like a dry deciduous forest or like in, you're in Krishnagiri. Um, to, so to set expectations, um, to understand what the land can offer, what it cannot offer, um, visioning is really important. So we have a whole questionnaire. Uh, there are lots of, lots more questions in that that we send out to the client first. Then we do an environmental studies. This is a document that has some primary uh, research and some secondary research. Um, here we study stuff like climatology, like the climate information we get from the internet. We have the survey map through which we study the contour lines and we have uh, understanding of the topography and the water flow, elevation studies, slope analysis. Um, on site, on our site visits, we also extensively do interviews. We, we confirm all of these things that the maps are telling us. Um, we talk to neighbors, locals, we understand history, um, history of the land. Um, geology, fauna, flora. In some projects, we have the privilege of documenting it for a long period of time. In some projects, it's you know it's a shorter time, where we then equip the client to do those uh, studies. Uh, one more thing to add to the environmental studies that that's the stage where we interact with experts. Since we're multidisciplinary and we're ultimately the designers. We collaborate with ecologists, biologists, uh, geologists, and that's where we get in their inputs. And after the environmental studies, when we actually uh, compile a list of elements that are grow going on the ground. So similar to an architecture project where you know what kind of rooms are coming in a house. Similarly to that, uh, we have the different elements that go on ground. So this depends on the client's vision as well as uh, the studies that we've conducted. But usually, uh, It'll, it'll be something similar to a farm quarters, there'll be a wild zone, there'll be a food forest, uh, there might be a veggie growing area. So we map the inputs and outputs of those uh, in this process that we call elements and linkages. And although it looks pretty complicated, um, some simplicity emerges out of it. So whatever elements uh, kind of win this process are the ones that are at the center of human activity. So in permaculture, um, which is where we derive the zoning process from, uh, there is this concept called zone system. So it starts with a zone zero and then goes to zone one, two, three, four, and five. Uh, the way that permaculture defines it is that zone zero is the center of human activity. Zone one is something that you visit every day uh, very frequently for management. Zone two, three, and four follow that. And zone five is usually a wild zone. 
So although this is a process from permaculture, we, we tend to uh, interpret it depending, differently depending on the project. Uh, so yeah, typically zones represent the user's energy and this allows us to efficiently plan uh, the piece of land. It, it also buffers us from, like in terms of energy efficiency, literally with your logistics and uh, utilities and everything, it's very efficient. Uh, also, in terms of conflict, where you know where you keep the wildlife away in the zone five, and you know in the zone zero, you don't have much interaction. So, in a lot of ways, zoning solves a lot of our problems uh, when it comes to design. So, this is an example of what uh, zoning typically looks like. The yellow zones are the centers of human activity, uh, and then you have orange, which is uh, frequent management, red, which is less frequent management, and ultimately green, which is least management. Uh, and over here, these are the wild zones. We try and make sure that there is a wild zone in every single project, even if that project is just 500 square feet. We try and combine it with different elements, like a living fence, some place where uh, natural succession can take over and then some native flora can thrive. And from the zoning, uh, the master plan emerges. So this is a very detailed master plan. Uh, this is put to scale on softwares like CAD. So it is actually implementable on ground directly. But we prefer to keep it a little colorful and uh, easy to read because ultimately uh, the people on ground who are going to be implementing it, like the workforce, uh, they need to be able to read the map as well. So we prefer not to keep it too technical like a, an architect's drawing. And this is another example of a master plan. So this is uh, about a hundred acre, 1800 acre farm in Kur, a coffee plantation, where uh, upon doing the environmental studies, we realized that the habitation zone had to be a very small part of the land, and most of it had to be wild. Um, so the environmental study is like a bedrock for us to validate our design. So. If, if the clients often want to change the habitation zone, they like a certain view, uh, we, we look at examples where you know that has happened. Um, we have this document to really you know keep reaffirming that no, there is wildlife activity here, this is, this is the floodplain, there's a water channel here, this is the reason we cannot. So it's a bedrock and it completely dictates the design and the design is actually the easy part, it's the byproduct of what the land is telling us. Um, um, a, big, a big part of uh, how we keep our aesthetics really nice, uh, we get a lot of appreciation for it is not, it's a functional thing. We want people on the ground, we want the clients to understand uh, the functions and why it is done in a certain way. Uh, and so all our communications are kept very simple and very attractive looking um, and uh, yeah. Uh, if anyone's interested in looking through an environmental study sample, because it's a very long document, we can't feasibly presented on screen. Uh, we have it on our iPads here, so post the presentation, you can always come and take a look at it. Okay. So that's our process. Also, the master plan comes with a design document where, you know, there are individual sketches, there's maintenance plans, um, there's working drawings. Uh, so that is the whole bundle of things that we submit to a client. Um, Moving on to, we thought we'll take you through three projects which have been more wildlife heavy. We do only design human habitats, but there are aspects of wildlife uh, that emerge in our projects. So the first project we're talking about is Elephants by the Lake. This is in uh, Krishnagiri, the Shulagiri site uh, around KGF Road. Uh, the project was initially called Alfonso by the Lake. It was a mango farm. Um, but as a testament to uh, honoring the elephants that visit the lake in the property, we've uh, collectively named it uh, Elephants by the Lake. Um, this is the master plan. If you can see, there's a lake in the middle. That's the lake. And then there's like a northern section, southern section. And there's a road right in the middle, like a spine. And there's left and uh, there's west and east on side. Um, the history of this land is that it was, um, if you see the satellite image, it was these forested hills, eastern ghats, uh, an extension of wildlife, uh, Kaveri Wildlife Sanctuary. Um, beautiful dry evergreen forest, very special kind. Um, what happened here was, uh, I think there was uh, mining for gold or something, so there was uh, excavation of the lake. The lake was just a small seasonal pond before. There was excavation of the lake and that soil was made to uh, uh, made into fields, uh, paddy fields first and then mango farm and then that was sold as private land. So when we came to study the land, we realized that the northern, northwestern section just above the lake 
looked like a wetland. There were species uh, in, the, in the monsoons, uh, there was a lot of flooding, we saw a lot of frogs, nesting birds. So there were evidences of what the history of the land was, although now it's like a flat piece of land, it's terraces. Um, in terms of the zoning here, since the, the vision of the land was that clients wanted some habitation, some buildings, but largely they wanted us to um, uh, represent some regenerative farming practices and then also some rewilding strategies. So um, we had the privilege of studying this land for six months before we started uh, implementing design on it, which we don't in most projects, but in this project we had that. So we had a person, a project manager stationed on ground for six months collecting data. Um, none of us are ecologists or conservationists. This, we do this out of passion. We bring in experts. So in a very rudimentary way, we collected we did a count of biodiversity in 2021. Uh, birds, mammals, butterflies, amphibians, insects, reptiles, and then 2023, after implementing the design, we, we were counting through, uh, you know, through the years. Um, and there was an increase in the faunal biodiversity. Not saying that it was all a result of, um, you know, the, the design, design and the implementation, but, uh, I mean, we also had uh, help with help of experts, and then we also went through different seasons, so we got a better count, but a lot of it, is an impact of non-intrusive living on that land where we were protecting it and we were inviting wildlife in. We'll go over some of the strategies that uh, you know we we consciously worked on. Yeah. So as we had mentioned, zoning is always our first strategy. So in this particular case, uh, when we went on land, we found that the main habitation zone was a camping ground uh, that was on the north of the of the site. And uh, after camping there for many, many days, we found that, you know, we would sleep, we would be sleeping in the tent and then we would hear scratches outside and we would see sloth bear's cat, uh, we would hear of monitor lizard out, liz lizards outside. So out of fear and uh, love for biodiversity, we moved the, bio, the, the wild zone away from there. So that was the main change that we did. Um, another thing that we did was... Uh, the whole, the whole area was frequented by elephants, um, so we consulted with experts from Arosha, an NGO that works with elephants, uh, to check whether our zoning was appropriate for this, uh, for this site. Um, yeah. So, sorry, one more thing. Go back. One more thing to mention is that since design is always an iterative process, we always have a first draft and a second draft. So the first draft and the second draft are usually Six, six to ten, 12 months apart. So after implementing certain strategies, we see whether they're actually working out and then we come up with a new draft. So in this case, you can see that the green area, which is the wild zone, wraps completely around. And then we have more buffer zones and then only the yellows are habitation zones. So we, we've kind of insulated it pretty well such that the, the human activities don't disturb the, the fauna in any way. So on the left are photos of the camping ground uh, before and almost immediately after we vacated this area, uh, we found signs of a lot of wildlife in the area. So uh, we set up some camera traps. We had a dhole visiting, which was uh, super exciting for us uh, because they're very endangered. Um, we also had a lot of avifauna. We had sloth bear cat. Uh, another thing that we tried, is, it's not a foolproof design, um, but we tried to do, our, one of our colleagues designed was, I mean, this is generally something we do in all our projects, where if overgrazing is an issue and uh, we want sort of to bring the, allow the grasses to grow a bit, we fence it from cattle. But uh, in this project, we wanted the, the deer and uh, the wild boars and all the other smaller mammals that were using the land to still be allowed inside while keep the cattle out. So our colleague designed this, uh, this type of fence, it's just something to consider that, you know, barbed wire is not the only way to fence something. Here, the top and the bottom wire are smooth, and then there's a small underpass that are put in certain areas for the smaller mammals to come through under and for deer and things to jump over because it's a smooth wire. This is a very hard thing to implement on ground, to be able to dictate, you know, inches of distance between wires through a land that big. Um, also, it's not foolproof because, you know, we did see goats come in and it failed in certain areas, in certain areas it worked. But, uh, but as a strategy to consider that, you know, fencing doesn't have to be a one same solution for all parts of the land, you can sort of um, 
play with what you're allowing, what you're not. We also had these drop down sections for where the elephants were coming in from. The forest department would tell us when the elephants are in the area and then we would unhook sort of this drop down area where the elephants would come from. Again, this is a very iterative uh, observe and react kind of a design where elephants would come wherever they want from. But uh, something that we tried to uh, keep in mind. We saw ungulate hoof marks from the underpass, so we were very happy that they were using it. Camera traps caught deer um, come into the property, so that was one thing. Um, earthworks for wildlife. So in the wild zones, one of the things that we do is uh, make earthworks if needed. So this was designed to be a watering hole. Um, in this area, the elephants would come and break the uh, pipes in the kitchen for fresh water because once they come to the lake for one, two days, the water will get really murky and they were not drinking that water. So instead we dug like a watering hole and then we, and this is very close to the open well. So at five feet we hit, we saw water and the water started recharging itself in this small pond. So it was almost like many things coming together and like manifesting itself as a uh, water body. Um, yeah, this is purely for wildlife and then we saw that in the camera trap that this is where the dole was coming towards. It came down from the hills and we tracked the uh, bug marks and we saw that it was coming to this uh, pond. Uh, we have photos of the deer, we saw a lot of hoof marks. So uh, we work with contour maps a lot and we love designing for water. So that's usually the crux of our design and where water goes, flora follows and then fauna follows. So uh, a lot of our designs are pretty earthworks heavy. Um, and not necessarily earthworks heavy in the sense like heavy earthworks, but we focus on earthworks a lot. And in this area, uh, we found that as we had, as Janani mentioned, um, the northern area seemed to be a wetland, a seasonal wetland. So in order to uh, help that process along and in the process of converting it from an Alfonso farm to a wilder zone, uh, we designed a simple bund so can I just point So we just designed a simple bund over here uh, according to the contours, downslope of the contours, such that water would naturally collect in the rainy season and uh, we saw that it reacted very quickly. So in about a month or two uh, after the rains, we had frogs nesting there, we had a lot of birds nesting there. Uh, this is a photo of an Indian rock python in those wetland areas, um, yeah. Uh, another uh, intervention that we did in some of the land buffering right next to the forest was we planted some native trees. Um, we set up a nursery there uh, on site and uh, our project manager was going to the forest with the com local community collecting seeds. Uh, I think they had about 70 species of uh, native dry evergreen tree species and we planted them. Uh, we only planted them in some areas. Some areas we left alone because that also is the do-nothing part of uh, wildlife restoration because if you do, you need not interfere everywhere. Um, there's a principle in permaculture that says everything gardens, which means that, you know, birds and other animals are doing their seed dispersal. So as humans, we don't need to like control everything. Um, as long as we are good custodians and protect land, uh, a lot of it will automatically become forest. Um, wild zone, yeah, trails and signboards are very important, especially in projects that are uh, elephant country. Um, it, and you know, you, we know that we, if you see when you're hiking in the Alps or you know uh, the Black Forest in Germany, there's there's a lot of signboards that really strictly tell you what to do, what not to do. Um, so we take that very seriously. We consult with experts for this, and uh, we make them into visual signboards that get then get printed and uh, put on trails. Trails are marked. Timing is something that's very important when you're living with wildlife, uh, especially uh, especially sloth bear, um, you know, avoiding dusk and dawn and all of these little things that can happily, very easy to implement and very easy to coexist is is, is something that um, is, 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 a, is a very simple protocol. Um, in one of our projects actually, uh, we had an incident where there was an elephant attack because uh, the the timings were not followed. Yeah, yeah. Somebody was uh, um, straight off the trail uh, at night, and then there was an attack. So it's a very serious thing, and uh, we we keep these as non-negotiables in the project. 
uh, although the work is design heavy, it's often not directly impacting biodiversity, but bridging the gap. So setting the stage behind the scenes work. So community outreach is a very important part of this program. So over here, we uh, conducted some uh, reptile workshops with the community, uh, talked about venomous, non-venomous snakes. And so there was a lot of awareness and curiosity that was created. And uh, at this point, they know a lot more about this and they don't just you know, see a snake and kill it. So we make changes uh, in those areas. We also collaborate with experts. So as I'd mentioned, we uh, consulted with Arosha with respect to our zoning and master plan. And uh, there were some places where we had designed differently and after input, we realized that we should do it a different way. For example, um, we had actually planted a lot of elephant attracting trees in the habitation zone, uh, thinking that, you know, we are giving space to wildlife in the habitation zone because that's what we thought was right. But after consulting with them, we realized that that should not be the case because that probably increases conflict in those zones. So then we re-looked at our zoning and planted it in different areas, just the wild zones. We also set up a lot of camera traps at key points. So they helped us with this. And they also gave us a model to monitor the biodiversity using a grid survey. Uh, just to mention in the previous slide that these are all like highly uh, uh, trafficked uh, wildlife. Um, and then the staff would send us photos of these. So it was very uh, humbling to know that these animals are safe as far as they're, you know, they're within the farm. Yeah, um, so the second project that we wanted to talk about is Tamarind Valley Collective. Um, here there was no, there was no vision of rewilding as such. It's a community of farming collective. It's a group of 40 families, 40 plus families who bought uh, 70 acres of land or so in Tali. And uh, if anybody, yeah, this was in 2017. This is one of our first big projects. Um, this is what it looked like, it was fallow land. I think the topsoil was sold off uh, as red soil when we were left with this and there were like a handful of tamarind trees that we would run to for shade. Um, there were a few kites in the sky. Other than that, like we don't remember seeing much uh, wildlife there. Um, and here, the, and since it was our first project and it was sort of an experimental thing, the main thing that we did was nothing. We, we focused on, yeah, this is how our master plans looked back in uh, 2017. Um, so we didn't touch most of the land. We um, we focused on zone zero, zone one, set up a first shelter, um, started farming around, made some earthworks, and we found those leverage points and did earthworks. Like we said, the you know the, the minute you fix water, you slow down water, you increase infiltration. Everything else automatically follows. So now in this and in the community are all very aligned, and they keep coming together every weekend. They work on the land. They're very passionate. Um, so now this is what the project looks like. There's water, there's dense planting in some areas, there's so much food that's been grown, so many areas are just left wild. And these are some of the photos from their WhatsApp groups. These are these are habitat specialists, you know, for it's it's for them to come back to a place that has been rewilded is is it's such a it's a validating thing because these are very rare species. This is what their WhatsApp group looks like. They're monitoring everything. And, and this is how they do the biodiversity count when, when we can't do it, uh, when we are no longer engaged in the project. Um, this, is, this is the information that we get from it. So the third design story is actually uh, less designing for wilderness and human habitats and more designing for human habitats and wilderness. So this is probably one of our favorite projects when it comes to context. So this was um, in the lower Shivalik's range, just above Jim Corbett. So you can see the site over there, completely surrounded by dense sal forests, uh, 360 degrees, frequented by uh, large fauna. We had elephants on site, leopards, tigers, deer, wild boar, uh, all of this on site. And uh, apart from that, this was also an aband abandoned farmland. So there was a lot of erosion and uh, yeah, because there was intensive agriculture going on there at one point. And this is the uh, master plan, which I'll be explaining in the next few slides. So yeah, these are a few photos of the fauna that we found on ground. This is uh, one of those projects where we were privileged to be able to spend time on site studying the fauna ourselves. So you can see elephants in the GIF over there. Just, this is just in the wild, in the human habitation zone itself. 
So the first strategy here was the environmental studies, but super detailed. So since this was uh, an agricultural land, it was kind of a blank canvas in terms of planting and um, any sort of interventions. So we looked to the forest for inspiration. Uh, and since this was an edge ecosystem, there we, we looked into the streams, we looked into the sal forest to see what we could create on the land itself. Um, we also wanted to go upstream, so we wanted to see where the water comes from, where the springs start. So we conducted some very detailed studies. The second strategy here was zoning. So when I spoke about zoning initially, we said zone zero, uh, human habitation zone and center of activity. And up till zone three, it's still human habitation zone. But in this project, uh, only zone 0 and 1 were actually centers of human activity and zone three, and four, 3, 4 and 5 were actually wild zones of different types. So here you can see most of the land was actually zoned as a zone 5 and zone 0 was limited to this area. So the context here was that it was an eco resort so we wanted to have some cottages uh, in the zone. So this is where we put them and the rest of it was left for the wildlife. The next strategy was fencing. So typically when we have uh, a piece of land, we'll consider fencing it off completely. So that was the first approach that we thought of. So we thought of creating a fence all around, leaving certain key points open uh, based on where we had seen the wildlife enter and uh, traverse the land. But then we realized that was kind of redundant because anyway the fence was being left open and we were kind of saying that the whole land is actually for humans and not wildlife and we dictate when they come into the land. So instead of that we fence the humans in. So we only fence zone 0 and 1 and we kept the rest of it completely open. Uh, there were also some very prominent water flows on site, so there was a stream flowing through the center, so we leveraged that and had it meander uh, to the left and the right and we created a few basins for wildlife, so we created, a one, we created a really nice elephant pond over here, there were a few smaller basins for turtles uh, and ultimately the, the water flowed to the streams that uh, flow on either side of the land and met those. Yeah. And this is the final strategy. So uh, because this was an eco resort and the people who would come here would want to interact with the wildlife in some way, the first thing was that it was only visual uh, interaction. But uh, we also set up a few key trails through the land and outside the land. Now we wanted to give the uh, the wildlife either time or space, so we, this was very strictly regulated. So either people would only be able to go at certain times, or they would have to go assisted. Uh, I mean, with a, with a guide from the eco resort. Yeah. Um, so tying it back to those five tenants that we were talking about throughout, um, the first one is do nothing. Here are photos of some really beautiful insects and spiders and fungi that will only be seen if you, if you are very non-intrusive, if your garden is wild, if you're, you know, if you've not interfered and tamed it too much. So, and it takes an expert sometimes, you know, when we, if in some of our projects, it takes a lot of studies to arrive at what, where not to do and what, what it is, in, and I mean, as in where you should do nothing. So, in, in, even during our vision, sometimes we question that saying, what is the need, why the whys instead of the whats. Um, so do nothing. Land is always uh, going through a form of, uh, going through a, um, a journey of succession and uh, you know, you're, you're just a gardener as a part of it. We don't need to completely control it. Observe and interact is to, um, like in traditional landscape design, like, you know, you would want something and then you would go like impose it on the land as it is without thinking about changing it, without observing it through different seasons and cycles. 
Um, so one of the things that differentiates us is how iterative our process is and you know we keep having to negotiate with the clients, uh, we keep observing, observation is always key. There, there is no expert in a living system than a person who spends the most amount of time in it, observing it and uh, understanding it. So observation, um, observe and then interact and then react is key. The third tenet is uh, know where you are, basically reforge your connection to the land. Uh, we do this through, again, the environmental study and kind of asking the question, where do you stand in your ecosystems? So this is one example of how we do it. We create a bioregion map that uh, shows the custodian, you know, where they stand with respect to the wildlife reserves around them, the lakes around them. Uh, initially, it might just seem like a small one acre piece of land that has just been going through intensive agriculture and doesn't really have much to show but when you view it in the larger in the larger picture you actually observe how the water flows through the land and how it actually connects to the larger river system and then it kind of shows you where you are the next one is build a home so this is not only build a home for yourself as in set up a base camp on ground so that you can venture out into the land and study it but also create uh, habitats for wildlife in your land uh, and sources of food and shelter. And the last one is, of course, value local biodiversity uh, because wild spaces in nature aren't really wild anymore when their inhabitants are gone. So uh, by you know reforging that connection between the custodian and the land, uh, we try and get them to value any and all types of biodiversity, including flora and fauna. So yeah, we, this is uh, a quote that constantly inspires us. So we just want to leave you with this quote. And now you have been taught, so <laughs> you understand and therefore you will conserve. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Janani and uh, Sanjana. So I'd, I would like to open up the, the floor to questions. Any any questions by anybody? Yes. Namaste. Thank you. Thank you very much for the wonderful presentation. Uh, I have two questions. I mean, uh, one is about the fences uh, that you told about uh, and uh, dropping down the fences by elephants and that part. Right? And uh, second question is. Uh, are we uh, trying to, I mean, uh, constructing home in the, what do, what do you actually mean by that? I mean, are we constructing ponds inside it and uh, we are planting native plants or something like that? Please throw more light on that. Thank you. Um, the drop down fence is basically just the section where we see the elephant coming from because we know where the forest is and, you know, they take that, whichever route that they're taking, we notice that. And that section, we tie a loop for the uh, stone posts and that wire is independent. So when we know that they're in the area and they might come, instead of allowing them to break over the fence, we unhook those loops and we drop those fences down. Mm -hmm. Manually. Manually, yes. So that there's no like breakage and repair that we already can foresee them coming and then um, put it back. It's not foolproof, it's just uh, it's one of the experimental ideas. Um, Yeah, so build a home is like first we tell our clients to build like a first, you know, instead of thinking of this big house that they have to build, which sometimes take two and a half years, three years, we say for you to be a custodian, you can first build a small shelter. So build a home so that you can then protect your home, which is that piece of land, and also extend it to other creatures. Um, so making ponds, planting, um, creating little habitats, micro habitats for other creatures there is also building a home for, you know, they also call it a home, which is your farm. So like that philosophically. Yeah, in, in within your farm, yeah. With, within your farm, like when you make a pond, you're basically building a home for frogs and fish. Um, then the ponds will start a wetland ecosystem, which the birds can use. Uh, when you're planting native, they have associations with, uh, f the flora have associations with fauna, those butterflies, those pollinators come, they have a home. So to think of home for yourself first, so then you can extend it towards other living uh, beings. 
Mm, thank you very much. So I have about a few questions. Um, so first, um, in, wouldn't we also want to focus quite a bit on microfauna and not exactly, you know, frogs and that kind of thing? Because in my definition, they're like kind of large compared to what I consider microfauna. So I'm talking about uh, these really rare insects, spiders, that kind of thing. Um, so I believe you showed a slide full of these insects. Mm -hmm. So um, what I instantly spotted there is um, your habitat is uh, encouraging a really rare species of jumping spider. That's what I instantly observed about that. Um, but my main concern is they're going extinct very quickly, species like that. Uh, in fact, uh, quite a few species of insects go extinct every few minutes so because there's not really the right kind of habitation. So um, they're actually really um, not as nice looking. If you overlook arachnophobia, they're actually really uh, as nice looking as a deer or an elephant and uh, they're just as important. So wouldn't we want to f focus specific environments on that specifically? So uh, I mean, we can show you the fauna map. I think that might be of interest to you. But uh, when we study fauna and we map out the fauna on ground based on the surveys that we conduct, we focus on smaller fauna as well. So for example, if there's a zone where we've noticed that there's a lot of spider activity, that is also a wild zone. Um, if we find that there's a zone with a certain type of grasshopper and there's a lot of that activity, that also becomes a wild zone. So we are constantly also looking down as we walk, not just you know at eye level. So yeah, it is as important. And spiders especially, if you see, they occupy niches where humans have not disturbed at all. Like they are like, you know, in your blind spots and that's where they exist. So, uh, so in a traditional sense, if you have a farm, you would garden all of it, you would use all of it and you would not leave these spaces, uh, which is why we make sure to do a living fence, which is where, you know, snakes and spiders, where you, where you can't access it, it's fenced off from you, it's densely planted. Um, if the land is big enough, then we do a wild zone where we keep the humans out. It is not interacted. It is for it is a like safe haven for these animals, um, and that's where we're hoping the microfauna uh, established. And they come much later. They come when you they they all they're almost watching you, they're seeing how intrusive you are, and then they sort of occupy the space. So it's a it's an it's a validation of how how you're living if you see a lot of spiders around you. So yeah, and, and that, that's why we take nice photos. I'm an amateur photographer, especially when you click uh, um, macro photos of the eyes of these little bugs. That's something that changes people. They, you know, the paranoia goes away and they see the beauty in it, especially with spiders. So I encourage people to take photos, cute photos of very small things. They're, <laughs> they're as important, yeah. Uh, one thing that I forgot to mention when we were speaking is walking the land with the custodian is one of the most important things we do because uh, when they see us interested in these things and we gather around a small insect, then they also develop that interest. So that's a very important strategy when it comes to designing for wildlife, which is what we found. Any other questions? Yeah. Thank you for the nice talk. Can you put some more light on financing part of this? Hmm. Interesting and toughest question. <laughs> hmm. F uh, are you talking about financing uh, for implementation or finance, like uh, to be lucrative to able to run the operations? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so our clients have mostly been private uh, urban folks who bought land in these uh, semi-urban rural areas and they fund it. Now 
we've worked with all kinds of budgets. We worked with very tight budgets where do nothing is sort of the only option <laughs> uh, for most of the land. Um, we've also had high budget, like the first project, EBTL, is uh, Zeroda's uh, farm. So we had a lot of time to, you know, experiment and use different materials. So it is privately funded. When it comes to, uh, if they are farmers and they're actually farming on the land, they might get subsidies on uh, sprinklers and, you know, the Krishi Honda, and in that way, the government helps out. Um, other than that, we've also worked with uh, real estate, you know, these farm man managed farmland uh, uh, companies like Hosachi Guru and uh, smaller companies as well. So for them, it's uh, they have investors and then they sell this idea of, see, you are one with nature, you are closer to, you know, you are planting native trees, we're conserving uh, river streams, riparian habitats. So for them, it's an investment into the idea and then it gets sold as a farm plot. Uh, the people buy into this uh, ethics model based uh, design. So it is funded in different ways. Um, but yeah, it, it takes, uh, it, you know, you have to have a certain amount of privilege to be able to do this work. And uh, yeah, the urban folk have mainly been our uh, customer, uh, clients. Uh, in terms of funding the project itself, often people come to us and they want to create a productive system like a farm or an orchard. Uh, which is something that we often don't prefer. So we try and redirect that towards hospitality. So we try and say maybe you can consider hospitality as a source of funds rather than putting pressure on the land itself to produce a certain number of kilos of fruits or veggies and so on. Yeah, and there are, there are quite a few projects that are Airbnbs. They, you know, schools come in, everything is designed to be like a guided tour of like some form of agro-tourism. So that sustains us uh, on a monthly basis when it comes to operations. And that's a very much easier model than agriculture is not lucrative. I think everybody knows that now. So yeah, hospitality, invisible structures as we call it, educational, agri-tourism, those kinds of things. Uh, hi, so you were talking about um, having these people be custodians and really become stewards of the land. So now when you're going through rewilding process of the land and now there are much more inhabitants, so how are the people on the ground prepared to deal with the changes the landscape and how do are they equipped then to understand about the balance between the interconnectedness because now you have established a newer system that didn't exist before. So now how how do you engage with the community and build the community based conservation in a sense? Uh, have Do you guys go back to projects or um, how do you build that community based conservation? So to begin with, uh, we have a very long document that the client uh, and the custodians read through and understand. And all of this is presented to them as maps and data. And we try and do this with anyone who's involved in the projects, including the workforce on ground, because ultimately they're the ones who are going to be carrying it forward. Uh, a lot of this communication also happens while we're implementing. There is a lot of, there are a lot of people on ground and we are, then we are able to actually like show them what we mean through you know, whatever process it were, processes we're implementing. Uh, yeah, this has actually been one of the most challenging aspects of all our projects, the, the people and uh, buying into this new concept uh, coming from city dwellers and, you know, we are looked at desk people and they are the real farmers. And so when, when it comes to new concepts, you know, simple things like mulching, um, it takes a long time to see the results of it. And, uh, and we can't preach it and we can't say do it like this because that never works. So we do it with them. So all our implementation, we are all workers and we also have a small team of well diggers who also do the planting. So they are sort of buffer between us and uh, the people on ground. So when all of us are doing something together and then, you know, they're able to see that, okay, when you lift up the mulch, wow, the soil is moist, there is more life in it. Um, it takes years sometimes and then it becomes their own strategy. So that's, that's how we've had success with, you know, with delivering uh, these new concepts. Um, but it is still very challenging. I mean, we try our best. We bring in experts who also act like they, they're, you know, when you, especially with living with snakes, um, even in their workshops, they, they don't talk against the community. They don't say this is wrong. You know, you should not do this. They always, they spark the curiosity. They talk about the snake. They talk about why that snake has come close to your house. It's probably shedding. It's probably it's mating season and allow to see the, you know, the lifestyle of that animal. 
um, and and then they slowly adjust. But it's never happened immediately. It's, it's quite a challenge. Um, in the last project we were showing in Uttarakhand, the somewhere project, there the client is very wildlife centric. The staff was also, that was their vision from the beginning, to bring in elephants, to bring in deer that people can see from the cottages. But the neighboring farmers were not happy with that. So there the community extended outside the land and they were like, we are here trying to get, you know, uh, get rid of the elephants uh, coming into our land and here you are growing grass for them. So that was also difficult and there you know, we had to explain that we are in the middle of their forest and, and this way they won't come up there if there is food here and you know, they won't come up to your farm. It is a lack of food, end of the day they will come. We all know that you can't stop them, it's their land. So yeah, it is challenging but... Uh, the only way is to learn and teach, teach each other more about the exciting ecological functions of these uh, systems. Yeah. Hi, I have a question and a suggestion. <clears throat> question is regarding, you say wilderness in human habitats. I'm a poor researcher. I don't have money and I don't have the land that you people are trying to show me. How do I go about designing wilderness in human habitats like the urban conditions like let's say in Bangalore 30-40 site? How do we go about it? First question. Second, I just want you to go back to the Krishnagiri uh, landscape where you have, you know, if you had shown me the pool. The, the pond? The pond, yeah. Uh, uh, the pond for the elephants, the round one. Not this one. A cemented where a man was standing above it. Oh, oh no, that was the open well. Open well, okay. Yeah. yeah. So, suggestion here is when you say do nothing, you'll have to do nothing there because our experience says that animals do not, animals are not attracted to perfect shapes like squares or you know yeah. circles or something like that yeah. so why not do it or construct in such a way that it's very irregular in shape and irregular shape basically attracts more wilderness yeah. so that's one suggestion but i just wanted your yeah, suggestion yeah. so to answer this first this uh, this was an open well that we dug for the people um, and this was not situated in the wild zone the ponds that we designed in the wild zone we tried to keep irregular as far as possible and uh, when it comes to do nothing in the actual like zone 5 wild zone, uh, we kind of just left it alone. Other than observation, we did almost close to nothing. Yeah, and uh, yeah, that's a good point about irregular shapes because also they are more resilient. If, if you make like a straight line in a pond, all that pressure is on that one wall and it will breach. Whereas if you're an organic shape, it will, you know, distribute that pressure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We just deliberately don't want that. Yeah, definitely. We are yeah. big advocates of uh, very irregular shapes of ponds because they also create a diversity of edges and diversity of depths always makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Uh, and in terms of in the city, when you have a small piece of land and you don't have the funds to do much, um, we have, we, like permaculture itself is always talking about low budget, low resources, close to you, uh, local resources. So in that sense, um, when, when we're like, say, lining a pond, for example, we find the lowest cost. Uh, we, we have a blog post of different types of pond lining that you can do at, and what it costs. Um, so we try and share information like that uh, on our website, on our blog posts. Mm, but what else would you do for a small piece of land in the city for... Uh, Try and incorporate living fences, something that is uh, unmanaged on some level. But uh, there's always that debate whether, like, what, a, what a, the fauna that comes in is it actually wildlife or is it does it not qualify as you know like a yeah because it's in an urban setting. That's some it is. I'm sure it is, but there are some questions usually on that front also. Um, also having small gardens wherever possible. And a lot of people come and say, you know, like we have pests in our garden and stuff, but there's always that perspective of if you don't have pests in your garden, then you're not really part of the ecosystem. So we try and cultivate that with uh, any custodians that come with very small pieces of land.
even even just not clearing it and protecting it from fire and overgrazing that itself if if it's a you know savanna type ecosystem that itself is a climax ecosystem and you know you protected it so yeah um yeah, bcc a bangalore creative circus is a very small garden about 800 square feet and then there's a grey water pond the hand wash water used to go into it it's in the middle of yashwantpur it's a industrial area and with volunteers, we did a garden and the trees grew like on steroids almost because it, the soil was lacking life, I guess. And there's a snake in that tiny pond in the middle of the industrial area. So it's, it's, it's lovely to see in an urban place where there's a lack of that and the dearth of habitats, how quickly uh, things are looking for water. But I would try and do a water body, I think, in a small piece of land. With respect to uh, fauna, yeah, yeah, we'd love to do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, progress, yeah. yeah. so since I mean we are on timelines, what we uh, the the one way that we tackle that is we do a baseline uh, diversity sheet, and then we hand it over to the custodian in hopes that they will add to it. Some of them do add to it, but yeah, needs to be done most. Yeah. If to go back and do that is yeah yeah so i me and my team have done the okay 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 nice yeah that that's more like that's required definitely uh so i have two questions more uh don't worry i won't make it long like the last one um uh so the first one is uh, so i live in a gated society near vipro and um it's pretty green so that's where i find most of my jumping spiders as i uh, study jumping spiders a bit so um so there i find quite a lot of mini fauna uh what you could say microfauna mini fauna that kind of thing and um so i was wondering it's already pretty green as you know if there's already a bunch of jumping spiders running around so um i was wondering what steps we could take to make it uh a little more green since it's in very close proximity to sarjapo road so um you could if you have space to plant things then you could just look into um, some butterfly attracting uh, plants. FRLHT has uh, a bunch of native plants. We have we have a nursery, Ananas has a nursery, but we have mostly trees. We haven't gone to the shrubs level yet. We recently only started it. So that would be good too, because but butterflies have a direct association, right? They're like larval hosts are uh, specific plants. If you don't have that plant, you won't have that butterfly. So maybe you can look into iNaturalist in the region, what butterflies are there, see what ones, which ones are rare and find the larval host for it. We also have a database on our website which tells you each tree and what uh, the larval host, I mean, the, their larval host for what. So that's one thing that I can think of. Um, you can do bird baths. There's always scarcity of water and, you know, we have birds coming in in the summers and um, that's something really fun to watch for people as well. We actually have a really infamous mine, a mine or something in our house. Uh, so it kept, it, it has a nest in the top loft mm -hmm. and it uh, worries my mother to death because it keeps dropping snakes and there's quite a lot of snakes over there. Okay. So, uh, uh, yeah, my second question is, um, is it possible to build at least a small town that is like entirely merged in with the wilderness? Like, uh, I mean, look at uh, Chennai elephants and also that very rare group of elephants in uh, China. So. People in China supported it. Um, I, I don't exactly know the reasons, but I know that people in China supported that small group of elephants. But um, in Chennai, they were trying to scare the elephants away using firecrackers, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. And uh, you had this really big controversy about a pregnant elephant exploding because of a pineapple which had a firecracker inside of it. Mm -hmm. So um, to prevent such incidents, is it possible to make a small town at least uh, i don't exactly know about the situation on the tamarind farm i would assume i i'm not sure if all the 40 families live in like a small town together which is like right in the 
said place uh, i'm not sure of the situation there but uh, is it possible to make at least a small town like that i think uh, rahul's better equipped to answer the elephant question <laughs> 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 the town, yes, absolutely. Yeah, you can build a town where all the buildings are together in one place. Uh, that way, your uh, human footprint is uh, restricted, and then you're only allowed to take uh, a certain trail where you walk, and your timings are also set so that the elephant knows that you know you're not going to be there at a certain time. You know, whichever other wildlife is there, um, absolutely possible. That's the dream. I think uh, permaculture aims to design for human habitats that are balanced like this. Um, are there anything existing, especially with elephants, is a big, uh, big question, right? Uh, I'm not sure. So conflict is a huge issue, right? And uh, elephant conflict management, unfortunately, has at least the policy. There is, uh, you know, uh, some say misguided policies or the interventions that they use uh, to kind of protect themselves or the communities from elephants, uh, and largely it involves using railway barricades or uh, fencing your entire property uh, with solar or in some cases uh, directly from the grid, which is even more dangerous and which is why most of the elephant deaths happen. Uh, so they, there is, I think, more to do with sensitization and uh, more to kind of uh, uh, get people uh, more aware that, you know, the space and the landscape has to be shared with other animals and uh, to leave those, there are traditional corridors, there are, cor and elephants just don't wander off uh, just for the heck of it. They, they have those specific corridors that they pass through and if those are blocked, then they have no other choice than to move to other areas. So we need to kind of relook at that and uh, things. So right now I think the government and everybody else are trying to uh, reimagine or, uh, you know, look at how we can, uh, change the policy of conflict management, but yeah, it's it's still a long way off. Uh, if there are any more questions, one last question. Hi, uh, how do you come up with the timeline to finish the project? Of course, there are so many factors which affects the timeline and delays it. So, what are the factors which affects uh, being a project manager myself? Uh, even a small delay might cost you a lot. It's mostly people that delay the timeline, usually. Um, but it depends on the type of project also. Uh, usually, our preferred timeline is about 18 months because then we have time to study the land for a full cycle and then make decisions. But more real realistically, it's about three months for design and then three more months for implementation, six months. And then we hope that any additional observations will be done by the custodians. Yeah, and from the beginning, uh, small scale intensive systems are something that we always uh, uh, communicate with the client. So whatever we're doing, we'll only do it in a small patch and observe it for the year, next monsoon, what are the tweaks to be done on those earthworks, have the plant survived it, and then we replicate. So that is communicated from the beginning. We will not go implement a 70 acre uh, thing with one solution that we haven't yet tested out. Uh, um, so yeah, and most of our work is concentrated pre-monsoon. Yeah, this is the time where everyone's calling and everybody wants work done immediately. Um, yeah, I don't know if that answers this. Great, I think uh, that's, uh, I, I hope nobody, I have not missed anybody, right? I have just one last question. Uh, so there is, you know, one school of thought of saying that, for example, I saw that you use an existing stream to create these other pools, right? That in a, in a way is changing the land use in a certain way. And that in itself is an interference to that particular ecosystem. What is, what do you say to those people that you shouldn't be doing these kind of things? Let the land be as it is and let it, because they say creating artificial pools and artificial things also disturbs the uh, traditional uh, migration of animals, which otherwise used to move from, you know, one area to another in search of food and water and so on and so forth. So what's your thoughts on this? Mm -hmm. Uh, we try and stay away from making big interventions in areas that are already having very established systems. 
so most of these interventions are in zones where it's very disturbed or it's kind of like very degraded and animals are not really frequenting it uh, so to speak so for example over here there were there were not so many elephants frequenting this area uh, there was a lot of uh, faunal activity on this side so we didn't do anything here we focused our earthworks here and uh, there's another wetland north of it. So the only thing that we did there was do nothing. We vacated it. Uh, and in terms of the other project where you were talking about the, the earthworks, even there it was uh, already an agricultural land and it was highly terraced and elephants were just passing through it. There were no uh, deep pools or any water bodies that we were disturbing in any way. Um, yeah. So we try not to do it in established wild zones. Yeah, it's the like when when you terraced a wetland. So it's like how would you design those undulations back, right? And it's impossible for us to create any design that would do that. So then we just slow down the the little stream that was left from a wetland. It was just this little mori like thing. So we just plugged it and allowed water to slow down and hoping water will shape uh, take shape. And for that wetland pond, we just built a small bund and stopped that water. Just a little bit of flooding. No digging because you can see little frogs and little fish uh, right there. So anything we would have done would have been detrimental to it. Except build a small bund, open up the stream for water to go flood those same areas a little more than it was. Okay. Thank you. So I think we've come to the end of the talk. So I'd like to first thank uh, Janani and Sanjana for an for a wonderful discussion and talk, and I think a lot of us learned uh, quite a bit about how to kind of uh, live in wilderness and build habitats within wilderness. So, thank you once again. Uh, a round of applause uh, to our speakers. Also, would like to uh, definitely thank uh, Mother Susan Sir uh, and the entire JNP team for their support and hosting us uh, today for the talk. Uh, I do request all of you to please do visit the website, uh, the consortium, uh, coexistenceconsortium.com, uh, to see all the details of all the various other activities that we have until March 3rd. Tomorrow we have an event that's happening at Rachnali Lake, uh, where we're going to be uh, launching the, the coexistence app, which is a citizen science bi biodiversity app, which uh, if you've heard of iNaturalist, it's on the same lines of that. We're having a, a little competition among the citizens on, you know, who you share your space with. You know, like the rural communities and people living in the forest share their spaces with large mammals. Uh, you know, we share space as well. So to capture that and, uh, you know, uh, post it on the app. So please do, uh, you know, look up the Coexistence uh, uh, app and uh, download it and participate. And uh, Yes, uh, I think that's we have come to the end of the uh, talk today. I'd like to, when Mr. Madhusudan would like to say a few words, please. Yes, I am. Thank you so much. One minute. Yeah, since he cannot thank himself, I wanted to thank him first of all, <laughs> and the the coexistence uh, consortium uh, for this wonderful program, and uh, primarily our thanks also goes to Dr. Chetan Nag. Uh, who is responsible for bringing this talk here. Um, otherwise, we would have missed out on a very interesting uh, issue. So thank you very much, Dr. Chetan. And uh, once again, thanks to you, uh, the, the consortium. And as a token of appreciation uh, from the planetarium, we would like to hand over mementos to the speakers. I request the, Mr. Rahul to do the... You please. Uh, so I'm the host. So. <laughs> thank, you. thank you very much. Thank you. So we have some tea and biscuits arranged outside, so we can savor that before we leave. And uh, one last announcement I wanted to make. Um, on Sunday, we have uh, our usual Copy with Curiosity talk, which is done in collaboration with the uh, International Center for Theoretical Sciences, ICTS. And the topic uh, is fitness landscapes and the predictability of evolution. This is going to be a talk given by Claudia Bank in the same place here at 4 p.m. on Sunday. So please do come back. Thank you.
Sorry, and I forgot to mention one last thing. Uh, we have a photo exhibition and film screening happening at the Infosys Science Foundation that is at Jayanagar South End Circle. Uh, it's on till Sunday. The photo exhibition is on throughout the day. Uh, the film screening, it's, there are two sets of curated films on uh, wildlife and co uh, conservation. Uh, it's between 3 and 6 p.m. on both Saturday and Sunday. So please do visit if possible. And there are uh, elephants at all metro stations, many metro stations, and there as well as lakes. So if you do pass by some of the lakes, please do go and see. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.